here at Hay, you're talking about how to live with smart machines. Mm. <laughs> um, what can you sum up people's worries as you see them, and what the solutions might be? Well, this is off the back of actually a book that uh, I just published uh, with a co-author, Roger Hampson, The Digital Ape, How to Live in Peace with Such Smart Machines. And The Digital Ape, actually it's an homage to that fantastic book by Desmond Morris about 50 years ago, ago The Naked Ape, which was a, you know, he's a zoologist looking on the human condition. As a computer scientist looking on the human condition, I wanted to write a book that, that, that was a generally accessible, but actually not a condescending book, a book that took the challenges that we all face uh, and examined them. Uh, and it covers topics we've just been talking about, the challenge of data. It covers the whole issue around the emergence of this blend of humans and machines at scale. And of course, it talks about AI quite a lot and what that's doing. Now, there's a huge amount of hyperbole around AI. You know, they're going to wake up tomorrow. They're going to take all our jobs. We're much more sanguine in the book. Um, Job creation has been one of the great human talents over the years. We've found all sorts of ways of giving ourselves new things to do um, for economic value. Somebody's got to sit at the end of those robot conveyor belts and buy the goods. You know, they've got to have wages to do that. We'll think of ways, whether it's leisure, social care, creative industries. There are lots of things for human beings to do. And the machines waking up, it isn't the artificial intelligence. I've often said it's not the artificial intelligence, it's the natural stupidity. It's allowing these machines to, in some sense, um, run, um, be weaponized, apply themselves in contexts where there is no human in the loop, in, at least in the supervisory, and or at least in the sense of, do we want to give these purposes over to the machine? We have a history of being stupid as humans, and we've and smart. had and smart, and smart. But when when we're talking about giving too much control to the machines, you know, I mean. Arguably, the financial crash happens yeah. because mm. the computers were getting so complicated, no one actually realised what was going on. And they have talked about weaponising robots. Yes, and indeed. yes, yeah. there's a discussion about it. But why wouldn't one nation say, "Well, no one else is going to"? We will. We have a history of being stupid. So, yeah. <laughs> well, we have a history of kind of uh, getting getting very close to the edge sometimes, and then staring over the abyss and thinking, "Well, maybe that's not just a smart thing." Dual-use technology is a great example. So. In chemical science, biological science, nuclear science, dual use. The weapons were built off the back of that science. Computing is no different. Um, and we know there is a daily 24-hour um, ongoing undeclared war between nation states or various actors who are trying to test, penetrate, and in some sense overwhelm each other's cyber infrastructure. This isn't the way for grown-up states to behave. So at what point do things get to the, a situation where you say, we've got to de-escalate this. We've got to actually put some limitation treaties in place. It's uh, not sufficient to kind of deny all responsibility. And I think that's what we're going to see emerging. Some companies, people like Microsoft talk about a digital Geneva Convention. Uh, people are talking about putting those limitations into our international law. Uh, it won't stop bad actors of various other sorts, but at least it's a start. So that's one place. And the other, of course, has been talked about a lot. It's where the debate around sentience and AI is helpful. I mean, I don't think they're going to be waking up. As I've said, we say, make that point at length and, and in some detail in the book. But it is about uh, thinking about lethal autonomous weapons. You know, if we do build the dull, unreflective Terminator, you know, that's not terribly smart. We need to think about uh, just how far we want to go with that technology and capability. Um, and as you say, financial trading, lots of areas that are critical to our modern society. We need some way of staying uh, alert to the ethics and the morality of how those systems are being deployed. At least I'd argue that open societies need to do that. Are we at a stage with artificial intelligence now where um, the programs do learn for themselves and then come up with new solutions or algorithms that we genuinely couldn't hmm. have come up with ourselves. Well, that's, that, that's one of the great, I say breakthroughs. AI has been running as a subject for 60 years. You know, it was christened in the Dartmouth Conference as AI in 1956. Um, I went up to read my PhD in AI in an AI department 40 years ago and each, each 10 years or so, we seem to have a breakthrough moment where we take a piece of human ability and defeat it with a machine. In 96, it was Kasparov with chess, Lisa Dole with Go last year, 
and we all worry. Um, what that's demonstrating is our AIs are extraordinarily good now, superhuman in tasks that we can specify and understand. And in fact, they can improve and self-improve. The challenge is this whole idea of general intelligence or transfer across tasks. And that proves much more challenging, much more difficult. We think it'll take many decades to unfathom that. Um, but certainly we can see in everything from scientific discovery to uh, navigation to even composition, uh, writing programs themselves, machines are within limits able to uh, learn new solutions that were not, and the old, the old adage was, well you can't teach a machine to do something that the programmer didn't program it. Well not if you have a learning capacity in the system. It allows it to go beyond the performance that was originally given to the system. So here's an idea that I'm sure you've heard before, but if not, I'll, I'll take 10%. Instead of waiting decades for a general artificial yeah. intelligence that can learn everything, you just have um, an umbrella of specialised artificial intelligences, yeah. and one thing at the top that says, I need a navigation expert, I'll call on you. I'll need a, a writing expert, I'll call on you. Put that all in one big black box and call it a pretty general artificial intelligence. Well, you call it a federated system, and, and actually people have even argued that that might be one way of making sense of how our central executive works. You know, maybe that we're a set of kind of expert modules in a sense. Uh, it's certainly a way to think about building adaptive smart systems. Um, I'm always aware that when we build these systems, we may or may not be building something that's close to how human um, cognition, intelligent problem solving works. But that's an approach. The question would be, what does that central module do? What does it need to do, that central executive? Um, it needs to know a lot of things about the appropriateness of a method for a task. It needs to have some general sense of what the overall um, interests and intent and goals of the system are. The thing that we should never forget is that the goals and intents of the system are things that we give the system. And that's the piece, again, that humans are fundamentally in control of. They're not the machine's goals, they're our goals that we encapsulate in the program. So although that might be an interesting concept, it's still one that comes with a lot of complexity around working out how it could be organised. And even if we had that, I think we'd have a very interesting, agile assembly of methods and approaches to solve problems, but it wouldn't be the whole deal. Do you ever, and is it within your, your sphere, to think about sentience and consciousness mm. and whether something we create could ever be deemed conscious? I think. Or I whether think, the magic is yeah, still out there and undiscovered. That's so interesting. I think it, many of us in AI were inspired by that question. The audacity of even being able to take a scientific or an engineering approach to that question. It is the hard question, it's called the hard question in neuroscience and philosophy. And I think what I would say is after decades in the field, that question is as remote to us, is as uh, difficult for us to answer as it was back then. There is, people think it's just a matter of enough components and the quality will emerge. Other people think there's a piece of secret source we haven't discovered yet, or there's something ineffably different about us. And you can take, they're, they're, they're basically different philosophical positions on the nature of mind and self-awareness. But look, this is a fabulous field. It allows us to enter into questions around exactly that. And I think as engineers and as scientists, it is incumbent on us to think about the philosophy, not just questions of consciousness, but questions of ethics and morality. And we deal with that a lot in the digital age. What's your personal belief about what is consciousness and what is sentience and, and whether they're the same thing? It's hard. It's a hard problem. I, I struggle with this and, and again traditionally people have had a view that are we telling ourselves stories in our heads? Are we in some sense a, a cultural construct? There are people who think that our sense of individual selfhood is very different from culture to culture. There was a famous uh, um, um, uh, um, intellectual, Julian James, who wrote this extraordinary book some decades ago called The Bicameral Mind. His view was that it was actually a literary invention, that um, the Greeks had a view of the voice in their heads as the gods, and it, it actually took us uh, an act of uh, almost cultural creativity to create the notion of personhood. I think it's much deeper than that. I think there is something about 
your first person awareness mine of course the great thing is i can't prove that you're having them but it's a good mm. working assumption i am assuming you are and i'm I think <laughs> thinking the same about you to be honest and uh where does that arise where does that come from that problem has uh, been there in the background of human intellectual thought i'm sure since we s first started having thoughts and of course there's the other question when did this first happen how far back do we have to go so um i don't have the answer to that but i do think as a materialist i do believe that there that in a some sense we are a function of our biochemical endowment of billions of years of evolution there is an answer in there somewhere. But at some point, that collection of It's not going to come popping up in 20 aware. years' time, no. Really? Not even in 20 years' time? Oh, God. 